Hi, I'm Steve Bowler, the founder of Universalist Radhakrishnanism. In this series, I use Meister Eckhart, a mystic warrior for our times, by Matthew Fox as a guide for how we can be mystic warriors. Goddess constantly seeks the well-being of all, like a loving mother. Of course, we have free will and therefore, the divine plan is not always realized. Just like human children don't always fulfill the desires of their mothers. But the mother goes on loving them and wishes them the best possible outcome. However, as devotees, we consider ourselves children of God and surrender our will to the fulfillment of her or his will. The more love we exhibit, the closer we are to Goddess and become agents of divine love for all. Thus we help manifest the spiritual realm in this world, making it a better place. Universalist Strata Krishnism embraces panentheism, seeing Goddess in all things and all things in Goddess. Therefore it's easy for us to show love to all. The theology is consistent with quantum cosmology. We're in harmony with contemporary quantum scientific thought and do not experience a conflict between science and spirituality. Quantum physics grounds our theology. For Adrian Rich, creativity and destruction were incarnated in the goddess. Even death was part of a movement in time, part of the cycle leading to reincarnation and rebirth. Goddess embodies all things as symbolized by the yin-yang symbol, or Shiva and Kali. Death is as important a part of life as birth. Everything contributes to our spiritual development. Patriarchal religion mostly eliminated the presence of the Divine Feminine. Universalist Radha Krishnism restores the balance between the masculine and feminine aspects of Goddess. Men and women are both created in the image of the Divine and are equally capable of acting as agents of the Divine. Eckhart says the reason people do not bear fruit is that they have no trust in either God or themselves. Love cannot distrust, and no person could ever trust God too much. Trust matters, Eckhart says, for there is no better sign of perfect love than trust. To act effectively, we first need to trust ourselves. Without this, we can't accomplish anything. Then we need to trust in Goddess to give us the strength, guidance, and resources to accomplish our goal. We also need to trust the people we work with to share our goal and provide skills we lack so we can accomplish great things for the common good. Everything is interconnected. By working for the greater good, we benefit ourselves in the process. It's not only the results that matter, but selfless service benefits our spiritual growth. Eckhart says nothing in all creation is so like God as silence. He presents silence as letting go of all images and forms in order to entertain the one silent word of God. For Eckhart, this divine silence is not an absence but a plan and even a blueprint to a life. When we quiet our hearts and minds, we're able to hear the still small voice of Goddess, guiding and encouraging us as she or he whispers words of love to soothe our souls. Fox points out we all have to entertain non-language and silence and death in the presence of mystery. What are the mysteries greater than our work, our words, our thoughts that we take with us to our graves? Are they not written in silence more than words? Words are inadequate to represent the real mysteries we're faced with. Make time to simply be in silent contemplation 
which is the opposite of the media-driven society we live in, that pollutes our minds with useless sounds and images, as well as religions that want us to take their words as God's literal truth that is not to be questioned. Carol Chris says, the experience of nothingness often precedes an awakening, similar to a conversion experience in which the powers of being are revealed. Buddha sat under a tree, Jesus went into the desert, and mystics of all times and places sought that inner peace, silence, and emptiness that allows the spirit to enter in with new truth. If we're full of and invested in old teachings handed down to us, where's the room and receptivity for new wisdom direct from the source? Fox explains, to reach this more creative place, we often must first become full with nothingness. Chris compares this experience to the mystic's dark night of the soul, and she insists that it needs to be accompanied by the courage to see. Most lack the courage to see and hear new revelations, preferring the comfort of old, tried and true teachings. Birthing something new usually involves pain and suffering. We best birth the divine within ourselves and be reborn within cosmic consciousness. Eckhart says, I discover that I and God are one. We ourselves take on a divine mode as sons and daughters of God. It would mean little to me that the word was made flesh for man in Christ, granting that the later is distinct from me, unless he also was made flesh in me personally, so that I too would become the Son of God. Creativity is requisite for us. We exist to give birth. Eckhart writes, human beings should be communicative and emanative with all the gifts they have received from God. If human beings have something that they do not bestow on others, they are not good. People who do not bestow on others spiritual things, and whatever lies in them have never been spiritual. In this way I devoted my life to spiritual teaching. This included working for peace, a living wage, the environment, and other causes that benefit all. Enlightenment doesn't eliminate responsibility to work for the greater good of all intangible ways. Everything is interrelated. We here to make a positive contribution. Eckhart says words too have great power. We could work wonders with words. All words have their power from the first word. Although the Godhead is beyond words and description, words are still helpful because they guide us to the divine. Therefore, I devoted my life to preaching, teaching, and writing the Word of God. While my every word may not be the Word of God, since I invite Goddess to speak through me, I believe at least some of my utterances are divinely inspired words of God. Rich recognizes that coming to grips with the Great Mother, including her powers of creativity and her powers of death and destruction, is essential to male as well as female consciousness, particularly in today's patriarchal culture, which peddles so many negative images of women. Creativity is key for a new vision to occur and men must find it within themselves. I'm a rugged male and have proven myself in difficult circumstances. I also have a softer feminine side that manifests in devotion to Radhakrishna, in compassion and empathy for the suffering of others, in creative expression, and so many ways. 
Carl Jung called these two parts of a person the animus and anima. We all have these male-female aspects, but we're conditioned to focus on our dominant sexual identity. As we're able to break out of this stereotypical conditioning and manifest our dual nature, we can live more fulfilling lives and end the battle of the sexes. Rich writes, one of the devastating effects of technological capitalism has been its numbing of the powers of the imagination, specifically the power to envision new human and communal relationships. Seeing the raging conflicts existing today from the individual to the international levels, we need new ways of relating based on interconnection, cooperation, and love. Rather than focusing on differences, we need to recognize the common good and work to attain it. Adrian Rich does not define modern feminism in strictly political or cultural terms. For her, feminism amounts to a radical defense and embrace of the divine feminine, one that would change not just society, but our definitions of ourselves. For Rich, as for Eckhart, the spiritual, the personal, and the political are inextricably linked. We need to see life holistically. If we want to change the world, we need to start by changing ourselves. Then we can change our families, communities, nation, and world. Erica Jung defines feminism this way. By the feminine, I mean the nurturing qualities in all people, whatever their sex. Let us all nurture one another and nurture the earth. We'll all be better off for the effort. If Rich sees the role of the poet and the role of the revolutionary as totally compatible, it is because she understands that the most profound revolutions will come from the development of our capacity for empathy. The goal of the redefinition of the human is all about nurturing empathy and compassion. If you like what you heard, pre please click like and subscribe so you don't miss upcoming episodes. Thank you for listening.